So I'm going to assume that what I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, you already know a lot better than I do. So I'm just going to, you know, pretend that you're talking to me as I speak. So my name is Vesper Stamper, and I'm an illustrator. I love my industry, love my art form. Wouldn't want to do anything else. So um, I'm going to be talking to you about cultivating an analog life. And as I read my notes from my iPad, <laughs> and I want to say one thing before I do, which is that you are free to doodle your thoughts as I speak. I hope you do if you're um, visually driven and you need something to do to fidget. You can uh, doodle your thoughts. And um, you can tweet it to me, actually, at Vesper Ill Illust. It doesn't go to illustration on Twitter. It doesn't spell out Vesper Illustration, the whole thing. But if you look for Vesper Illustration, you'll find me. And tweet it to me with the hashtag analog soul, okay? And I will see it. Um, there's also going to be a Tumblr post on the talk that I gave today and this so that we can further dialogue about this. And now, talking about the analog life. <laughs> okay. So my work as an illustrator is that I interpret the language, the language of others into my own visual language to expand its ability to communicate to an audience. So even though I work in traditional media, uh, real paint, real pencils, physically carving linoleum and, reno and rolling out ink, I rely heavily on technology. I might touch up my, fine, my final art, removing flaw, flaws, excuse me, that's the New York coming out, correcting color and the like, and sometimes I do create my images di digitally. I also use it to communicate with my clients and my agent, to send sketches and final artwork, and to network, building up my fan base and getting my name out there. I am what you would call a heavy tech user. But all of this leaves my soul feeling a bit frayed around the edges, and I don't like what it does to my brain. Uh, my thoughts tend to be more clipped and disjointed. I forget things more easily. And I hug trees a lot less than I mean to. <laughs> and I don't like when I, my first impulse when I get fidgety with my hands is to reach for my phone instead of my pencil. I do less personal work than I mean to because my time is cut into. I don't mean to spend six or seven hours on Facebook. I don't think any of us really do. So even though I work with my eyes and my hands, I've often struggled with feeling that I don't fully occupy my body. So we've heard that, um, now I did these drawings on the plane, so <laughs> I don't know if they will make any sense to you. They might be a little weird, but. Um, so we are sp a spirit. It's been said we have a soul and we live in a body. And all of these together are what makes us who we are. So an artist is someone who occupies and works with their body, but leads with their soul. And this is why artists can often come across as soulish. When we live in our heads and assert our wills and give in to our emotions first, maybe this is the whole human race, but particularly artists um, do this, without being led by God's spirit. But leading with the soul is also what makes art so potentially prophetic. An artist interprets the language of the, wor the world around us, saying what others feel but may not be able to speak. So leading with the soul makes us vulnerable in a good way when we're tender to the Holy Spirit, but negatively when we absorb everything around us without the Spirit's discernment. If the eye is the lamp of the body, as Jesus says, then artists are the ones who always seem to be under the glaring bulb. We're always taking in the world around us, and we can't help it. It's just what we do. And now with 24-hour news cycles and constant access to other people and their constant access to us, the bombardment can be intense and it can never stop. As physical as art making is, whether it's dance or drumming or painting eight-foot canvases, artists are notoriously neglectful at best and damaging at worst to their own bodies. Artists can often feel that our bodies are a hindrance to our, to our art making, and that if only we didn't need these pesky things like food and sleep, you know, we, we could be a lot better at our craft. And the truth is that the soul needs the body, and the, and the body needs the soul, and both the soul and the body need the spirit, especially the Holy Spirit. Now, how much more so the artist who leads with the soul needs to cultivate the kind of life that allows the living water of the Holy Spirit to flow through us unhindered, in and through us, so that our art making is inflamed with his presence. If the artist's lamp is always on, we must become vigilant about what that lamp shines on. So what, this is my five senses drawing, <laughs> such as it is. Um, so what the eye and the other senses see, the soul absorbs and believes. 
and the body will manifest. Can the artist truly be available to the Holy Spirit if he or she is living cut off from those five senses, attached to a device, to mindless social media, to pornography, to numb eating, to cheap sex, to one too many drinks? These, these are all ways that we assault and stunt the senses on which we depend as artists. Our senses take in the world, our souls interpret that world, and then our bodies, in a cycle, manifest that interpretation through our art. If we're sinning against our own bodies, or if our bodies have been sinned against and that trauma has not been dealt with, what are we telling our souls to believe? And what will our bodies manifest as a result? The psychologist and author Catherine Steiner Adair tells a story about a teenage girl who, um, she would, who was having trouble finishing her homework. She would get an hour of homework, and it would take her four hours, and neither she nor her parents could figure out why this was happening. So when they observed the girl's behavior, they realized she was on a 15-minute loop. Every 15 minutes, she had to you know, get on Facebook, write a status, text a friend, um, put something on Instagram, do something you know, outwardly with, with her social media. And when Steiner Adair worked with her, she found that this girl was almost completely devoid of an inner life. Let that sit with you for a minute. That should make you tremble. A 14-year-old girl devoid of an inner life. And this is our culture. This is our culture. So her answer to this was to get the girl to text herself. So when she would get on that loop and she'd have the urge, she would have her right to herself. And by doing this, uh, she was teaching her to meet her own soul. So here are some ways in which I'm trying to go analog in my own soul. From 2011 to 2012, I was in not one, but three car accidents. And I had some cognitive difficulty. And the neuropsychologist neuropsycholo that I worked with was, um, he had me stop using my phone to check my calendar or take notes and start making physical checklists again. And within a couple weeks, um, I was able to retain more information, process thought more easily. It's just a different mechani mechanism in the brain. So I try to write things down as much as I can now. Uh, one year during the season of Lent, I went on a Facebook fast after realizing that all of my thoughts were met with an impulse to share them publicly, and I was praying exponentially less than I used to. So I determined to turn those thoughts to prayer, and I had an amazing season with the Lord. Um, this Lent, I'm trying to turn my, my attention to the enjoyment of food, which has been for me medicinal for so long. Um, it's actually a discipline for me to enjoy food. I'm very good at giving stuff up. I'm very good at that. <laughs> um, but slowing down and enjoying a nice tomato diced with olive oil and lemon juice and salt and pepper is, you know, that's like my goal for Lent this year. <laughs> that is a spiritual exercise for me, and it's, it might sound like the opposite of Lent, but that's my Lent. <laughs> Um, I started grad school this past fall, and I had been listening to some really good teaching on healing the soul, really acknowledging and getting familiar with how my particular mind, will, and emotions worked, and surrendering, surrendering those and the wounds that that soul had received um, to the Lord. And very quickly, my practices began to change, and my work began to flow with, first of all, more output, more depth, more connection. And I also determined to be, become entrenched in my sketchbook, and eliminate any other ways that I was using my hands that were taking time away from my drawing. I went from filling a couple of sketchbooks a year, thinking that, oh, well, I just think my thoughts out, I don't need to really sketch them out, um, to filling four sketchbooks within three months. So uh, another thought that if you have writer's block or artistic block in any way, the only answer is to work. That one's for free. So as artists, and especially artists of faith, we must seek to unapologetically nurture our bodies and souls so that they are responsive, flexible, and vulnerable to the leadership of the very person of God who lives within us. We must not sell out the gift of our bodily senses and, and the awareness of our soul's needs in the name of cheap comfort or mindlessness. Saints, artists, we can do better. So how can we cultivate this analog life? What is one thing in your life, the first thing that comes to mind that you know of, that you can change from digital to analog. Maybe instead of starting a movie at 10 p.m., you can physically walk yourself to bed, put all your devices in the other room, and turn out the light. If that's too early, you can even start going to bed a half an hour early each night or each week. 
than you usually do. It'll be uncomfortable at first. You may sleep poorly for a few nights, but give it a try. It's part of making your art. Maybe instead of being ever connected to your phone or your iPod for music, you can dust off a CD, or better yet, a record, or better yet, go to a live show, or better yet, sing yourself. This is part of making your art. Maybe instead of plugging in at the gym, you can walk in the woods or dance like crazy in your room and feel what it feels like to really occupy your own body. This is part of making your art. Maybe instead of opening a box of, mac, box of mac and cheese or a packet of ramen, you can buy one gorgeous heirloom tomato and have it with some sea salt and lemon juice and salt pepper. <laughs> Sprinkle of basil. This is part of making your art, actually. One of my professors says he sees no difference between um, preparing a beautiful meal and creating a painting. Maybe instead of texting your friend all afternoon, you can meet her at a cafe and set aside an uninterrupted hour to talk. This is part of making your art. Maybe instead of sitting next to your husband watching Downton Abbey, <laughs> not guilty, <laughs> you can switch it off and share love together in the bedroom, looking into, into the eyes of another Holy Spirit indwelt human being. This is part of making your art. I like that one. <laughs> Maybe you can reach <laughs> sorry. <laughs> maybe next thought, instead of uh, maybe you can reach out at church and become the crazy lady who holds out all the babies and not give up until you learn what it makes to, to make them fall asleep in your arms. That's part of making your art. Maybe you can visit your grandfather and ask if he'd like to tell you the most important things that he's learned in his life. And maybe one time, you can bring your pencils and do his portrait so his face is etched in your memory. This is part of making your art. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. And may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So cultivate an analog life. It's good for your soul. Thank you. Yeah.